Hi there, it's Ron Gula with another episode of the Gula Tech Cyber Fiction Show. Today, our guest is Doug Howard. Doug, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me, Ron. Thanks so much for joining us today. We've known each other, I think, more than 20 years. Yep. It's been a long time. A long time. And would you say that you are Mr. Managed Security Services? I would say I um, follow the mantra that if you do the same thing over and over again, then you don't have to be as smart as the rest of you guys in the industry. Uh, so my sixth ser you know, security service provider in a MSSP slash MDR model. So what's the difference between MSSP? What, well, first of all, for the viewers who are not in the vernacular of, of, of acronyms and whatnot, what's an MSSP and what's an MDR? Uh, and XDR too, right? That's so, right. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll try to follow the general guideline that Gartner put out because I think it's not bad. Um, so MSSP, Managed Security Service Provider, traditionally was a log-oriented uh, company. So in other words, they would take all your logs from your systems, your security devices and everything, compress those in, analyze those, and spit out um, a alert that was of good value. Uh, for customers. As more devices came online, as EDR came online, uh, there was a recognition that having more context relative to the endpoint devices, not just syslog, uh, would provide higher value and higher fidelity. And then Gardner kind of put all the MSSPs because they started doing EDR into the MDR bucket. And so pure play MDRs that were only doing endpoint started to evaporate because they couldn't compete necessarily in that marketplace. Um, and so all of a sudden everything became MDR. In reality, um, most everybody supports EDR, supports syslog, supports network, supports everything else, which has now become managed XDR uh, in the grand scheme of things. And all of it is for finding hackers on your network. So I always tell people that if you're a small business and you think that you know you don't have the resources of Citibank, you probably are outsourcing IT. And unless you're asking those IT people to hunt for you, to mm -hmm. look at your security, you're probably missing a whole world of potential ransomware, potential phishing attacks, that that sort of stuff. So where are you now? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I would add to that, right? Like I believe if you think about the general marketplace and what the value proposition needs to be to the client is yes, we need to be able to filter through everything. We need to tell you when a bad thing is happening or pre hopefully, you know, as early indicators before the bad thing happens. However, I, I think the part that the marketplace misses is we see a lot of things in operational data that needs to be improved to really improve your hygiene. And so if you think about patched systems, you know, we do vulnerability scanning as part of a service. So we see all the vulnerabilities. So where are your highest priority assets in your overall scheme of your data? You know, where is your domain controller? Where's your DNS? Where does your PII data sit? Where does your PHI, you know, all of the critical data, where do those things sit? Now let's make sure that those receive the highest focus area to be able to do a hygiene oriented cleanup so that on a consistent basis not only am i watching your network 24 by 7 and making sure that bad things aren't happening right now but i'm also making recommendations hey you have open ports hey you know i've seen some patching that's maybe not following a good hygiene perspective on some critical servers um you know everybody can't respond to everything that needs to be fixed like that's a general acceptance in the marketplace but if i can give them recommendations associated with that then the whole you know xdr space improves from a management perspective and and the value to me is like MSSPs, just like Sims, got bad reputations in the marketplace over time because they just produced too much noise and catch certain things. XDR gave them a reset button. Okay, now we've got a whole new class of, of uh, you know, providers that are in the space that can do a better job. And I think XDR is just another reset that says, okay, a lot of people are already doing XDR elements of this, but now let's do more in the industry really to help those customers from an advisory perspective to improve hygiene on a regular basis. So I call that balance between hunting and hygiene, the cyber poverty line. If you're, if you're just hunting and you don't give a crap about fixing open ports, that's the hygiene side, then you're missing out. And of course, if all you're doing is just running after this compliance stuff, you're, you're kind of missing out on, on that. So where are you practicing this now? 
Yeah, so uh, obviously Pondurance is uh, my current company that uh, we have a team of experts that have come together from, you know, a, a broad base of uh, providers, you know, uh, people from FireEye, people from Amazon and Google and various other companies that bring a, a pretty wide array of expertise to the, the table from you know, pure product EDR all the way through the services side of the business. And we're applying, you know, much of what I described to that. Now, we believe to be a true advisor to the customer over time, you have to do certain other things too. Like vulnerability scanning is kind of a you know bare minimum requirement in the in the XDR space. I think if you look at the overall NDR space, being able to not only manage the EDR uh, servers and infrastructure, but actually take actions from a improvement of blocking capabilities as part of that as well. Um, and then customers have compliance uh, concerns as well. And so the way that I've kind of position this um, to investors, and now obviously we're practicing this in collaboration and, and Pondurance, is being able to look at your four primary risk. And, you know, used to, we said, you know, risk to your revenue slash mission, risk to your reputation, risk to regulatory requirement. I, the one we add, we do a lot of healthcare as well, is risk to safety or human life. And we add that on top. And what we say when we go into a client is we want to prioritize your risk and reduce that risk on a consistent basis. But what we really want to do is make sure that the highest risk, human life, um, is protected at the utmost. And, and it's not just the obvious things, like a device connected to cyber that is connected to a human body that can influence you. That's obvious. But a medical record. If I say I have an allergy, they write it down, but somehow that gets changed in the system, then obviously if they administer penicillin and I'm allergic to penicillin, that's going to be a, a bad outcome. If I have an autonomous vehicle that is, you know, in a minery environment, driving around but still people around, that can be compromised and be used as a weapon. So, you know, that human life is the key element that we focus on. But also to do that, you really need to have the human element. So unlike a lot of technology providers that are only focused on, hey, I'm going to build this best thing in the world that does this best thing in blocking, for example, our belief is that you need that human touch, especially if somebody's looking at you as an advisor. And therefore, while we want to take out the human manual work that you know doesn't add a lot of value, we want to move the people up into more of an advisory role so they feel like every interaction is inclusive advice, not just do this and not give them the context. Of that. So I really like that. So it's, it's uh, protection of life. Mm -hmm. What was the third one or second one? Second one was revenue mission. Revenue, brand, mm -hmm. and then what was the first one? Uh, last one was regulatory. Regulatory, so compliance, yep. that kind of stuff. That I really, and now, is that a Ponderance thing or is that a Doug Howard thing? You know, Dennis Devlin. I don't know if you know Dennis Devlin. I don't know him. I know to, who he is. Yeah, yeah. so he used to be um, the CISO of Thomson Reuters. Mm -hmm. He was my partner yep. at uh, Savanture uh, along with Patrick Gardner. Uh, he has used that ever since I've known him. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept adapting that uh, yeah. as a driver within most of the yeah. businesses. I, I think analogies for cyber are so important because the general public we live in a bubble and the, and we have such a hard time with the ones and zeros and MSSP versus XBR, yeah. you know? So these things like the cybersecurity uh, freight matrix, the yep. NIST cybersecurity framework, yep. things like, you know, the Center for Internet Security, when mm -hmm. they used to have their like 700 controls and stuff, and now they got levels one, two, and three. Simplifying things is really, really good. Absolutely. And I really like how you've, you've broken that down. And now you didn't just come up with this, you know, recently, you've been in the business for a while. So you started mm -hmm. in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. You went to uh, CSC, mm -hmm. did some telco work, Sprint and AT&T, which yep. the, I don't think the telco providers get enough credit for yep. the amount of cyber uh, work. and what Worked with Ed Amoroso over yep. there. Yeah, of course, yeah. as now doing Tag Cyber, exactly. which is the the, uh, the anti-Gartner, yep. right, which is, which, is, which is good. And then you also did one of the first MSS pieces where we got to, to meet the first time you did yep. Counterpain. Yep. With uh, I, I think you were teaching cryptography to Bruce Schneier. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think not. But... Right, that's that's great. <laughs> and and of course you did a couple other startups, but yep. then you were also at RSA. I was. Yeah. So that that's a phenomenal career. I mean, you have a lot of different perspectives on that. So when when you look back on that, you know what are what do you what do you what do you think about where where the industry has come over the last twenty five years? You know, either the highs of you know 
kind of getting Chris Inglis into the White House, yeah. right? Or maybe the lows of failures in industry to protect an oil line from like, you know, causing gas right. lines, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think the interesting part of all of this is that what you missed in there is I did Vbrick in between. Oh, I will get to that. <laughs> which was a video company, completely different, right? And and that was an investor thing. But but what I learned is I kind of left the industry for three years, I think it was, three, three and a half years. And so when I decided to come back, um, because what you do realize about this industry is there's dollars to be spent versus in the video industry, there's, you know, capacity requirements customers have to buy. There's security, which they have to buy now as well. And there was video like way down here, right? Like it, it, it was it was not the highest priority. It always got pushed in the grand scheme of things. But when I came back to the industry, I called a bunch of people and I said, you know, hey, look, been out of the industry three and a half years. It wasn't like I didn't read anything, but you know, what's changed? And and the reply was nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Like yeah. same fundamental problems, few new products, like lots of change that everybody perceives happening fast. But a lot of the same problems just still exist, you know, and, you know, I, I think that's when I kind of really took a step back and, and focused on that hygiene aspect of it. It's like, look, leverage the best technologies you can. They'll do things uh, that, you know, older products haven't or people haven't optimized their existing products on. But really being able to reduce that risk on a, on a kind of a concerted basis using, as you said, some type of framework, I don't care which one you use, that just shows that you're continuously lowering, you know, those higher priority risk was a key part of that. And so um, it's it's been a journey, um, you know, but when I look back, a lot of the fundamental problems of what we were trying to solve are still there. The way we solve them, significantly different, new technologies left and right. Um, and I had lunch with, you know, another industry person. And one of the things that I said is, and they said, what do you think about this? I was like, I think about it like everything else. It serves 85% of the problem and it doesn't solve the whole problem. So, you know, if you can get rid of two other things to, to now insert this, it's better. But in the grand scheme of things, it still doesn't solve the whole problem. And that's what the industry, you know, has, right? And there's just too many vectors and too many problems that one you know, one solution is going to solve all things. And again, great technology, great innovation. You got some great stuff in your portfolio um, that are, you know, changing the way we do things and certainly improving. But but ultimately, in the, the end of the day, we believe that, the, you know, there still has to be a human element in that uh, or it just doesn't get optimized in the grand scheme of things. I appreciate that. And if anybody wants to see our portfolio, go to Gula, G-U-L-A dot T-E-C slash portfolio, and you can check out all the great companies there. So one more thing on your career before we move on to to the topic of your book here, Security 2020, which he's you can buy today, but he actually wrote 10 years ago, which we're going to get into this. You were in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force. So how much did your Air Force experience, background, you know, whatever impact your career? Um, I think a lot. Uh, so first of all, I have to credit the Air Force for getting into this industry at all, because I went in tech control, crypto uh, space, and that was, um, you know, just a logical extension once you get out to, to go that path. Um, you know, I was 18 years old, didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, everybody was pushing me to go to college, um, you know, didn't come from a financially well-off family. So um, my path was, hey, look, I'm going to go in, I'll let the Air Force pay for my uh, college, um, and I'll get good working experience while I'm at it. Uh, they asked me uh, if I wanted to try to be a pilot, uh, which lasted about 12 seconds into an eye test, uh, which they basically said, you have no depth perception. I was like, oh, didn't know that, but you're never going to fly a plane, so pick pick your option two uh, and tech control, which is you know kind of the networking element of this and the security element at the time uh, was good. Uh, and so went down that path. Uh, I, I think the, the part that probably, you know, uh, the two elements of my experience that the Air Force really helped me with. So the first one is, is pretty straightforward, it happens with a lot of careers, it matures you pretty quickly. It gives you an idea of how to really tie what you do day to day, whether individual contributor, manager, executive, whatever it may be, into being able to follow a mission. Um, and I think a lot of companies, you know, create a mission and a tagline and they try to live to it, but maybe their heart's not into it. It's, you know, for the dollars or it's for the whatever. Um, and I, you know, for me, I always felt I wanted to do something that I was passionate about, um, and that it would help a broader good 
Um, and I think cybersecurity does that more today than probably when we started. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you think about it, the mission that you're serving and helping clients uh, is is a much bigger mission than, you know, just being a service provider or being a technology provider. I definitely see a lot of DOD people who've touched cyber. Mm -hmm. They go into commercial cyber and they're still carrying that mission forward, which is great. I think we need more entrepreneurs. We got to teach people to be entrepreneurial, even in bureaucracies and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So when they come out here, they can, they can do that. And there's a lot of folks out there doing that kind of stuff, but yeah. I think that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Oh, go ahead. Let me, yeah. So the second big learning. Yeah. Uh, so I think everybody's ability to deal with stress and prioritize things is based on kind of their worst one or two scenarios in life. And I was at a terminal of a satellite and we lost a DOD satellite. And uh, Colin Powell was, you know, uh, I think a three-star at the time, um, at one point came, put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, there are people dying around the world right now because we can't talk to them. And that kind of sets you in the context of what's relative. And so a lot of times now, you know, if a customer gets hacked or a customer, you know, has a problem or they have, you know, high stress situation, especially in the past, you know, with some of the, um, you know, nation states type of stuff is having that as a relative point of nobody's dying right now uh, is, is a good learning experience uh, that, you know, hopefully most people don't have to deal with in their life, but, but definitely learned a lot in uh, that environment. And since well. it was in the nineties, probably when that happened, we couldn't yep. blame China because they weren't, they weren't uh, the enemy of the de, de jure that above my pay grade at the <laughs> time. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's a whole nother episode. How does one lose a, 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 a satellite? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens. So, all right. So let's start talking about the book. So it's, it's tradition in our industry to come up with a bunch of news around New Year's Eve to, for cyber predictions for the mm -hmm. year after. And so, sometimes I do these, sometimes I don't do these. And a lot of folks are in this, they, they, sometimes I love doing them. Sometimes they, they, they kind of like, oh my gosh, I hate doing these. But you were probably doing those. But then you basically wrote a book called Security 2020. Yep. And you were trying to speak to us now because not only did you write this, you know, uh, about 2020, but you wrote it in 2011. Right. But you probably started like 2010. 20, 2010 right. is when yeah. you started yeah. it, right? So, and, you know, calling it 2021 would have been, you know, you should have known you would have come on our show in 2021, called it Security 2021, but, you yeah. know, I'll let, I'll let that go. So why well, we rushed as hard as we could to get it <laughs> out in 2010, but it just quite didn't make it. So, <laughs> so reduce security risks this decade. Yep. So we're, I guess we're in the next decade if we're in 2021 we right now, right? Yeah. So why'd you write the book? Um, so like a lot of industry experts, you know, you felt you were being asked a lot of the same questions over and over again. Um, and, and a lot of them are like, what's next? What's the big thing? You know, those types of things. So that's why we all write those annual things as well as, you know, PR and everything that goes with that. Um, and you know, coincidentally, what happened is I got the book deal. Wiley called me, probably because of Bruce, actually, um, and uh, contracted me to write the book. And um, I then decided to leave the industry <laughs> and go to the video company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was supposed to take six months off, finish up the book, like get it out in 2010. Uh, took a whole new job, whole new career, whole different thing altogether. Um, and so I called, um, my CTO at the time at, uh, Perimeter E-Security, um, and so now Silver Sky, now BAE, um, and said, hey, you want 50-50 in? And then he took a new job and realized, like, this is going to take forever. Um, so, uh, we basically said, I called 50 people I knew and said, hey, look, I'm going to say something. I don't care if you agree with it or not. Like, what I want you to do is, and, and better if you don't agree with it, mm -hmm. and, just write, you know, another yeah, 500 words, 500 to a thousand words. Um, and thus the book came around. So it was, uh, it turned out a lot better than I thought. I mean, like anything, you want to spend more time and polish it and everything else. So uh, in hindsight, we do a few things differently, but like the collaboration of having 50 people contribute was very broad, you know, range of people that were completely business and investors all the way through practitioners to, you know, people building product uh, was was great. And those 50 people weren't just like 50 people you met at a security conference, right? These are some of the best folks in the industry. 
you had uh, Tim Belcher, yep. who I first met as the CTO of, of, of RipTech. Yep. Now he's moved on. He did NetWitness. Yep. He's doing a lot of investing behind the scenes exactly. now. Yep. So so really good. Let's see, you had uh, Maria from uh, America's Growth Cap. Yep. And Maria also sold Counterpaint. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so so she's she's helped out the industry quite a bit. Rick Howard, yeah. who was Mr. Palo Alto and now is Mr. Cyberwire. Well, and he was Mr. Army Cyber mm -hmm. before, uh, down the road, in fact. And uh, we hired him out um, as his first commercial job uh, at Counterpaint. Yep. And so worked with Rick many years. Great guy. Yeah, love him personally. I mean, he's, he's just a great guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, you had Mark McLaughlin? Mark former, former lived CEO, down, lived president down the street Alto, from right? us in uh, Leesburg before he moved out for Palo Alto, did VeriSign and a few others. Yeah, VeriSign, so, Cyber Moonshot. He's, yeah. he's on the NSTAC, the White House NSTAC Commission. Yeah. So a lot of good stuff. Uh, somebody, I mean, uh, you ran. <laughs> so the guy took over for me running, running Tenable, doing yeah. a great job. Yeah. And, uh, but he was kind of a competitor at the time, right? He was. And so Amit and I met at the White House. We were actually doing a speech to some cyber group within the White House and got stuck in a teeny tiny room together for an hour and a half. And so we're two competitors, but like, hey, we like each other. Let's, let's keep this conversation going. So yeah, good guy. It's th and that comment right there is really interesting. I mean, as much as cyber, it's not like, you know, we're Coke and Pepsi and we're trying to like, you know, solve the drinking requirements of the world. Cyber, we really are on the same team yeah. of protecting people's data. And there's a lot of com camaraderie, even though, yeah, my solution and product's better than yours. But the yeah. reality is, is we're really here to help. And, and it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. So, so when you go back to 2010, 2011, and you said, I want to write this book. What were some things you, we got a whole bunch we're going to go through, but, mm -hmm. but what were what were like some of the first few things? Oh, I could write about this. I could write about that. It, did, it, did it start flowing? Cause it's really well organized. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you Wiley for organization. I mean, they did a lot of that, but I mean, the predictions portion of it was really focused on, okay, what will be meaningful for people to think about in a scenario based um, situation? Mm -hmm. And so the obvious stuff was, you know, malware was big, but it was more AV type of stuff at the time. Ransomware was, you know, just a, a early indicator of things that might come. Um, but the, the real, you know, trend was there was something that was bigger than just what AV could block. Um, and so, you know, obviously we included some trends there around it evolving, becoming more impactful, kind of hinting to the, the ransomware type of uh, stuff. Weaponized IP, I think was probably, I, I, I always say I haven't ever validated this, so it's probably the first time that weaponized IP was used in the, in the industry. Um, and so, you know, we really focused on, hey, look, you know, the trends could get worse. Uh, no single products are probably going to solve this. It's going to expand past something of AV. AV may evolve. So, you know, it may become something more arguably, you know, EDR and AV started going different ways and started coming back together. So some of that type of trending that, you know, you're going to have to think about malware differently than you ever have before. You know, it's not going to be just load up you know, Symantec and McAfee at the time and, and boom, it does its job and you don't have to worry about anything. I can remember like late nineties, you were, you were really ahead of the curve. If you were somehow running, you know, McAfee or Symantec antivirus on every file attachment on your email server right. before it went to the endpoint where they ran McAfee or Symantec. Yeah, yeah. And then you had Tripwire, right? Like <laughs> right. in the mix there too. So what happened to the national identity management? That was a section in the book. Yeah. And now when we talk about, you know, a national ID for like, you know, election security yep. or, you know, voting fraud, that's interesting. But I always think there's a tie in there. Well, how come you don't think, how come you don't think we have more of a national identity management issue going on? Yeah, I, I think um, there's been some attempts, right? Like the U.S. Post Office tried to do some mm -hmm. things. Arguably, you've got electronic passport that kind of came and went, um, you know, so there's been some good attempts. Uh, I, I think what happens is the breakdown of the physical aspect of validation starts breaking down a lot of times, and nobody's figured out how to do that outside of the state level, and then the states want to kind of control some of that identity because there's a lot of revenue associated with that as well. And so I don't think a lot of the, um, the art of the possible 
has been limited by technology. It's been limited by politics and people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I still hope one day that, you know, that the, the identity has some value. Now, the problem is, I think, you know, and again, we could argue this all day long is whether it's biometrics or some other advanced element, anything can be hacked if it's data. And so, you know, if you have one centralized powerful thing, um, then you are, you know, creating, you know, a powerful um, target uh, or high value target uh, that could create, you know, a powerful impact to an individual if that is compromised. Now, the same thing happens a little bit at the state level and an identity level and everything else. But yeah, so were you involved with the post office effort? I, I, I was. I, got, I, got I, I was aware and asked for some, you know, yeah. input and different things like that, so but I didn't get involved in the. Bidding. I was I was briefed indirectly. So the basic concept was that if I mail you a letter in the post office, you know, your address, who you are, that is a valid private form of communication, mm -hmm. and it has federal law, and it has federal law around it. Right? It doesn't mean you have to do voting through postal mail. Right. Right. But it's there. It could enable a state to do voting by mail, which we just did here, right? So that's yeah. great. What they were going to do is tracks come out- Tracks deaths, tracks, you know, all the exactly. normal things that have become problematic. They were basically going to come out with an email version of mm -hmm. that, yep, where exactly. you could have certificates, yep. you could have that. Now, are you going to do a national ID? Oh, sure. Maybe maybe there's a way to register. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've actually been pitched companies where you get mailed, physical mail, you know, like a QRC code. Mm -hmm. Here I am at my house, somewhere in the suburbs of Maryland. Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm going to then tie that to this thing at my house, which is now now I'm online and and, and sure. I can do it. I'm glossing over a number a number of different things. Yeah, and, and and they covered the one thing they that the post office did that nobody else did is they had the validation of identity, mm -hmm. arguably um, down, right? So they bring in your passport post, you know. ID just like you did before, bring in a picture, they'll validate it to you, um, they'll do some basic validation, which could become more and more advanced over time, obviously. Um, and so, you know, it it arguably was the best thing. Now, yep. it was also tied to PKI kind of at the same mm -hmm. time. And so PKI kind of lost favor around the same time. For yeah, it's still it's still tough. And it's and then it gets political, right? right. Like, like, is doing voter verification somehow a racial exactly. profiling yeah. thing, right? Well, I'm not profiling gonna... period, right? Exactly. Like, you know, so. Exactly. And but the thing is is I do want everybody to vote. Right. I want it to be super easy for people to vote. I want it to be super easy. I don't want it to be super easy for for some Russian in Moscow to vote. Right. You know, and right now I I kind of think they can fill out a paper ballot in Moscow and mail it. I don't think that's happening. But you know what I mean, right? There's not a lot of Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, look, it, it, there's flaws in every system. Mm -hmm. it, it could be compromised, it, just like anything. Physical compromise probably has some limitations. Not that you can't take a bag of votes from Russia and drop them in in Maryland and, you know, bypass the whole, like, right. oh, it's coming from Russia. Um, it, electronics is always going to probably have more question than the physical aspects because it's harder to, it's easier to scale electronical compromise than it is to compromise physical compromise. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't do it, not that it couldn't influence a number, but like in the grand scheme of things. So a couple other, we're going to get to more of the predictions in the book, but mm -hmm. one of the things you talked about is future influences mm -hmm. on security. Mm -hmm. And the three things I pulled out of that were, were this concept of GRC, which we'll talk about, yep. this concept of journalism, which we'll talk about, but then the thing I want to talk about first is politics. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the Trump administration was was the first administration where policy kind of got ahead of technology, right? Technology was going way ahead of the politicians. Sure. But Trump was using cyber offensively, which caused mm -hmm. a lot of political po policy decisions. But more importantly, he just banned Huawei. Right. He banned DJI. Yeah. Right. Right. So so you know, is that what you were envisioning? What was going to happen? Yeah. No, I, I think the the influence aspect that I was referring to is with electronic reach of the internet in general, you can have a broader influence with good information and with misinformation, right? And it is so hard to validate, you know, good information versus bad information. I'm Republican, my wife is Democrat. Like you can imagine some of the conversations that happened in the last, you know, 48 months in, in that household, right? And, um, you know, much like you've named, oh, it could be this, it could be this, it could be. The reality is there's a lot of could-be's. Do I think they had huge influence? I'm not sure. 
but I know for a fact, both press wise, as well as Trump, as well as anybody else, um, there was definitely a lot of information that was, um, uh, that could be, uh, misinterpreted or used, you know, for somebody else's favor to drive a decision down a certain path. Right. And, and you know, again, that Republican, but you know, not a huge Trump fan in the grand scheme of things. But if you think about the aspects of some of the things he did, they were really good. Right. And, um, you know, from, uh, the way they were presented to the, the public, if you didn't do any fact checking, you could make some really good decisions and you can make some really bad decisions about what was said and, and vice versa. Like, you know, I used to, you know, watch certain news channels all the time and they just went, you know, so far extreme. Um, and, and all of them went extreme, right? It wasn't just like one went left and one went right. It was like, they went like crazy extreme, uh, that became, you know, more opinion than, than fact. Um, which was disappointing because, you know, used to, you turn to the news station to try to gather the fact part of it. And then you got a little opinion, then it became all opinion, literally little fact. And so that's what I was referring to is people using information to influence decisions that ultimately now can be done at huge scale and not fact checked ultimately in the end of the day. How do you feel about the modern way to talk to the people? This is almost like a Maoist you know, way to, 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 to subvert a culture where you bypass these media things and you communicate directly over social media, yeah. over TikTok, and you get these stories out there. And I think the stories take on a life of their own, independent of the, of the facts. They absolutely do. And, and I mean, you know, this is like the, the big dilemma and this has nothing to do with cybersecurity, but you know, you look at Facebook, like, I think it has everything to do with cybersecurity, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, arguably, but, yeah. uh, uh, it, it, if you think about, and, and this is where I'll say it's not cybersecurity, right? Is people have a right to their voice and I don't want to suppress anybody's voice. I may not agree with it. I may not believe it. What I want to do is be able to fact check it. And it's hard to fact check the volume of information that we get, especially if you get hundreds of people or thousands of people or tens of thousands of people, or you get... Uh, people that you think are credible and have been historically now saying something that you inherently want to believe because, you know, they are supposedly the experts in this. Um, and so cyber is the enabler of information and misinformation. Um, but I'm not sure we as infrastructure providers and integrity checkers of did point, did bit a get from bit b correctly that if we the technology guys and again there's people outside of technology that sit on top of that policy and everything else should be the ones enforcing what the content is and arguably you know that has happened with facebook and some of these other groups and i understand there's there's no checksums and you know there's no great answer to this either um but that's that's where i kind of like a lot of people in in a company, especially when you come in as new CEO, you know, what's your policy on this and what's your position on this? And it's like, guys, like we are a company here. We're being backed by a financial group. Our objective is to enable the internet to do the good things that it's supposed to do. And we have to take certain positions on policies like diversity, uh, which is a fundamental requirement, but there are other pol there are other politics that we probably shouldn't get involved with day to day. And so different companies have completely different opinions on that. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's I well think you've said. evolved. Like, I, I don't think we would have ever had a po political conversation. In cyber. In right? cyber, you know, 20 so years like, ago, right? When I look at something like Zoom, mm -hmm. where when Zoom first started, the reason I think that they are, are in cyber mm -hmm. is because we had Zoom bombings, right? We had school sure. Zoom meetings where we had people dropping porn on that stuff, yeah. right? You look at something like Apple's AirTag, probably mm -hmm. one of the best designed security architectures out there yep. you can use it to stock people oh absolutely. you know and they yeah, and it, it's it, so it's so i think there's these two you know this yep. i think dan gear is like you know all cyber technology is dual use right you can use it to suppress people and you can use it to to enable people which yep. is which is interesting all right so we talked about uh politics but with journalism but grc i mm -hmm. think a lot of our viewers are not going to know what grc is so what is grc 
So governor risk and compliance. So basically it is taking all those risk elements that I talked about, which aren't always defined quite that simply, and ultimately figuring out what policy procedures um, that I want to put in place to drive a constant risk reduction. Um, you know, Let me stop many, you right there and say, why do you think more people don't want to go into cybersecurity? Yeah. <laughs> Yes and no, <laughs> All right? right. So, bad, bad humor, but that was... Yeah, 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 no, I, I get it, believe me. Um, and, 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 and it's hard. It That's is. why I love it, by yeah. the way, because it is one of the things that when you start deal, when you start really trying to quantify risk, even cyber risk, forget broad risk, just mm -hmm. cyber risk, uh, it becomes very challenging to do. And too many times people try to take a broad base and like if you looked at RSA, for example, you know, arguably the leader in a GRC platform um, and yet it's got, you know, depending on who you talk to, 39 to 41 modules of risk management within it. If you break those down individually, they become manageable. That's why they created the whole modular attempt versus a lot of GRC approaches are here's my documented risk. I've got a spreadsheet of all my risk and I'm uh, like try to drive them down all the time. Like that too broad. Like there's no quantification. You, are you doing good things that probably are reducing yet risk? Yes. But did you prioritize the ones that are properly the ones that should be addressed first versus the ones that um, are lower priorities, but easier to do? That, that's a big thing. And that's why I think safety comes into that whole play of risk right now, because if you go out and fix all your patching on all your systems that have PII, but you left the healthcare system completely unprotected and all of your ventilators went down right now, like that's a really bad thing. Or the German case where they redirected an ambulance, right? Like those are real world scenarios where cyber has life and death um, impact. So with the the GRC, the governance, the the risk, risk and compliance, and the it, it's it's sort of like if you were in an airplane, and you know the pilot comes on the air, you're flying down Tampa on Southwest, and he goes, "Oh, say we're going to fly a completely new route at a completely different airspeed. We're just going to kind of make it up as we go." That's kind of what we do in IT sometimes because it, really it is. feels like the right thing. But then when you lay down GRC on IT, a lot of times IT people get they kind of have to kind of take it and say, well, yes, Mr. CEO or Mrs. Mrs. Board Director or whatever, uh, we will get let you use the Mozilla browser, I'm dating myself there. But but the point is, is we tend to have to say yes to different things mm -hmm. and it ends up making it a lot harder to defend the network. Right, and people don't consider the consequences because they can't quantify that decision a lot of times, right? And so, you know, you can use you know, any example, and, and this is the one I always use when somebody's like, eh, I don't get it, is, look, if you, you know, everybody knows what patch management is, everybody understands the consequences of not patching things sometimes these days. And so if you take the element of, hey, I have a web server with a medium priority patch setting completely unprotected on the internet, but it has PII data that flows through and has some that, you know, sets in storage and various other things versus I have a high priority patch on a element management system setting six levels back protected by, you know, micro segmentation and six firewalls and multi-factor authentication. What's your highest priority? Yeah. And it's because it's so every hard. standard right. says patch your highest priority for right. patch first. So is it is it threat based? Is it so? We'll, we'll, we there's so many ways to, to so let's let's, so let's we'll, we'll get back to the book in a minute. Let's talk about it. so Colonial Pipeline. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's an IT security manager in there right now who asked for a product, asked for a policy, asked for budget, asked for a person, and didn't get it, and ultimately that was the result of of uh, the the was it the Russian the teenage hacking club yeah. or? Yeah, yeah. What, what did CNN call him? Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so probably, like if they had a decent, you know, even IT guy, forget security, but a, a decent IT person, most likely that happened. Now, is that person still there? Is that person, did they send an email that documented, hey, look, these are the things that created a responsibility because now it's in writing for somebody? 
and, and this is, you know, kind of career advice for aspiring CISOs is look, your job is not to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It is to document the things that somebody needs to do and have a trail for there, because eventually that will be a good thing to have, not necessarily save your job or, you know, get somebody in trouble, but it, it shows that you're competent. It shows that you identified these things early on. Um, and it shows that the recommendation now would have been far less costly than the consequences that ultimately probably impacted the company such as this, including, by the way, I was in North Carolina at the time and couldn't get gas to get back to, to Virginia. But not, not getting gas made it <laughs> personal for a lot of people. Right. And frankly, solar winds, the exchange hack, even the Florida uh, 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 water mm -hmm. hack, it wasn't personal enough for people, yeah. but, but the visual image of people waiting to get in line. So the quote I used was, you know, uh, 2021 was the year that cyber moved from causing headlines to causing gas lines. Right? right. So, so great. Right. What, you know, how is that different than the other, other things out there? Like, do you think this will change anything? Um, do, do you think the colonial gas pipeline hack will change things whereas solar winds oh my god supply chain you know whatever i don't think it's going to change a whole lot of stuff uh, humans americans especially have short memory spans of bad things right like i mean again being you know ex-military you know if you go out and look at my truck you know it's got 911 tags still on it right 911 tags um, you know, that is something, you know, I think a lot of us think about on a regular basis. What could we have done differently? How do we, you know, improve? And that's why I, lo I love this industry, because I feel like if, if we're good, we improve our customers' lives every day uh, and the industry, arguably, if we contribute back to the industry as well. And, and honestly, the protection of one client helps the industry, period, right? I mean, I think we, we all recognize that. I think the um, the impactful things that occur impact some people, and there will be great things that come out of that. Um, I think when it touches somebody personally versus it's just something on the news that's kind of a little abstract, then they remember that more. Um, you know, and uh, you know, my my wife makes fun of me. Um, you know, as a professional prepper, right? And it's not like I have a ground, you know, underground shelter or anything like that, but, you know, like got some extra materials, got some, you know, backup, like I have two, you know, um, gas tanks for my uh, generator, you know, underground propane gas tank. Like I've got redundancy built into everything I have in, in the housing environment. Part of it is because I used to travel so much. So if anything went bad, like my wife wouldn't have to call me. That, that was the primary driver, but it was a good thing. Now, all of a sudden, even her, she's like, huh, like, I see how fragile the supply chain is, especially as we've moved consistently to, you know, just in time supply chain that like that could have been really bad if that lasted a week or two weeks. If that happened during the Texas winter storm. Well, and, and that's, and that's one of the examples in the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if you read that is taking a physical consequence and layering a cyber event on top of it um, could be catastrophic. And I, and I think anybody that believes that we don't have adversaries that can impact our power and utility grid is being naive in the grand scheme of things. And so you take that and you layer it into the worst winter storm, you know, in 10 years. In Texas history. In, in Texas. <laughs> but, I mean, think of New York, you know, 10 years or 15 years ago as well, or even here. Like, we got 36 inches of snow twice in, like, two weeks, right? And you start having huge impact on human life uh, at that point. So if, if an airplane crashes, we tend to fly airplanes the same way. We have a lot of investigations and board and we have the NTSB mm -hmm. and it's the National Transportation Safety Board, right? Mm -hmm. I always like to say that the T in that should stand for transparency mm -hmm. because we all get to see what I mean, like 737s can't fly. Yeah. It's, it's in the news, right? With cyber, we tend to overshare yesterday's threat intelligence and a mountain of vulnerabilities and we don't really have these great best practices as much as we pretend that we do what do you think we really need and and before you even go into that i mean even in the last executive order that came out of the president biden's white, white house mm -hmm. they want to have this review board of cyber mm -hmm. where they're going to get to the bottom of this but i i don't know i, I don't know that we have enough common play to it, but i'm curious what, what are your thoughts on that 
Yeah, I, I think, first of all, we have to recognize as an industry that the average security of any organization, including many of our government organizations, is so far underspent for the last 15 to 20 years that the amount of money that it would take to bring them up to even reasonably good security is a number that nobody would pallet. Um, again, unless, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you start shutting down, you know, uh, aspects that impact human life. Um, and, and then it's going to be retrospect, right? And like lots of pointing fingers and everything else. But, you know, arguably, you know, even with the increase of cyber within the executive branch and various other things, um, cyber does not have a loud voice within this. I mean, hell, Chris got more uh, exposure because of his Trump thing than he ever got. Yeah. You yeah. know, in yeah. all the cyber Literally, literally my stuff dad, that he did. When, when, when Chris <laughs> Cubs was relieved of his, of his job, my, my dad he called me, do, do you know him? Um, yeah, kind of, but he goes, oh, wow, he got fired by Trump. Like, yeah, and he was doing, like, some amazing well, things Well, that's what I mean. Country, like, right? He did, like, a ton of great things. Yeah, but that's what he's known, which is, which is tough. It's right. just tough. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. So we Although he played that well, by the way. So. I, and he's continue, <laughs> continuing to play it well. The, the, I, I think the cyber industry, I think people in it are starting to realize what a bubble we, we live in and that we really need to do more to reach outside to make it more of an inviting. Mm -hmm. This is what we're trying to do with the data care initiative yep. and what we're trying to do with just uh, the foundation and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. But I think a lot of people are realizing we just need to try better as an industry on a number of issues, right? The, yep. the, the diversity, mm -hmm. just the basic education of the, of the, of the kids and the policymakers. Yep. So, so it's, it's, it's good stuff. And well, and I know in, you've done a lot around the diversity part of this as well with some of your investments and stuff. And, you know, I've been a big fan of, of trying to do more diversity things. I did, um, at RSA, for example, um, we had a group in Egypt, um, it was, you know, started with, you know, two or three people when I, when I got there. And then when I left, it was 150 people, some of the highest energy, highest integrity people I've ever known. And we were able to move the needle where 53% of all management in Egypt were women. Um, we were able to uh, change the dynamics on age, bringing new people into the you know, industry as a whole. And that's, you know, everybody's got to pick their battle when it comes to diversity. My, my belief is, and this is what Pondurance is trying to live by, is there's a lot of diversity candidates in the industry, not near enough, not many, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So going around and just trying to hire based on diversity standards probably is not going to move the needle bringing diversity candidates in is all about hitting them in high school or earlier yeah. and getting energy and excitement about this industry, uh, which is very exciting. Again, if you can get people around the head of constant troubleshooting and new innovation, like it is an unbelievable industry for somebody to come in. And, and by the way, like I tell my kids is, look, go in this industry, you will never have to worry about a job for the rest of your life, right? And there's very few industries that you can absolutely say that about. Um, and so that's our objective. Take, you know, like SOC positions, take like BDR, business development rep positions where we have a high degree of new entrants that can be more junior in nature. And that's where we're gonna hit diversity. I think that's well said. So I like to close out, and I'm spending more time in, with, with this segment of the show with with fiction, right? So it's mm -hmm. Google Tech Cyber Fiction, and the book is not a work of fiction. But you came out, you closed with eleven predictions of the future. And I'm going to pick a few of them because I would encourage everybody to read the book. But you can get it on Amazon. Is it still still? I think I saw it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Yeah. I, w I would say uh, like I, I think I wrote after... a blog that had the ten of them. Yeah. So maybe go to the LinkedIn blog. Yeah. And, there you and go. Save we'll, your time we'll, reading we'll, the whole we'll book. We'll do that. So some of these are like, you know, really cool. They could be Hollywood movie plots or Hollywood theater. We like to say, right? Yeah. So one of them was all of a sudden GPS goes down, right? And you frame it like a Tom Clancy mm -hmm. novel, right? Airplanes being misdirected, trains crashing, yeah. and stuff like that. So what are the chances of somebody really modifying GPS, messing with GPS? So um, I don't. It, the longer discussion of how GPS works, it, it, you, you kind of have to dive a little deep in. But most of it's satellite oriented. There's a few number of satellites in the grand scheme of things. Most of them are aged 
tremendously. It's being upgraded, but it's it's still a relatively aged basic infrastructure uh, that is very fragile, which should be represented by the fact that half the time you can't get GPS signal, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they tied it more into cellular and some there's some, you know, backups elements of that as well. But, um, you know, I haven't stayed on top of it the last 10 years, but I will say that 10 years ago when uh, we had done some work uh, with FCC and some others, um, the uh, the military aspect of managing GPS, which is managed by DOD, um, is easily um, compromised from an availability perspective. And um, more and more, I think all of our lives and ways that you don't even think about are tied to GPS. And so um, you've seen plenty of movies where, you know, people modified GPS to make planes crash and different things like that. And all of that is true. Like there's some redundancy built in and, you know, some things that can help, but the world would come to a standstill if GPS went down. And I think it's one of those things. Not to mention Amazon. I mean, all these people driving around trying to deliver Amazon yeah. and have a GPS. It's <laughs> like, we don't do a good job as the cybersecurity industry of talking about what the inherent risks are. So GPS is, it, it can be jammed, mm -hmm. so it's not available. Easily. Yep. It can be spoofed. Can can, be I can spoofed. lie. I have a friend who works at Pokemon, mm. and he literally says, as they can gather like all the Pokemon Go people walking yeah. around, they can literally see where the spoofing happens because right. the person walking down the road next there or mile right, over here. Right, they want to drive them to this other location. Yeah, and it might next like speed yeah. be next to Area 51 right. or, or something, but but that that's definitely interesting. One of our portfolio funds, C5 Capital, invests in Satellis, hmm. and they have a secondary GPS. Right. So they are on the Iridium satellite yep. cluster. Yep. And I think that's really good. Mm -hmm. and if you ever read like 2034 right. or Ghost Fleet, yep. you know, there's a lot of space warfare. Yep. But he says space is the next, you know, the high ground for cyber. Yep. And I, it sounds good. I, I like it. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. The, the, and there's more um, dependency, I think, than people realize because while there are lots of satellites in, in the sky, it's a finite number. It's a small number relative to the number of pops that like AT&T has, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about the resilience that carriers have compared to what would happen if you took a few satellites out or a series of satellites out, um, which, you know, we all know EMP and various other things that could influence those that just, you know, it would be catastrophic. So now a similar one that was, that was in the book was what happens if the magnetic Poles flip. Now, I thought this one was much more on the fiction side of plausibility, but I, this is the kind of thing that happens. Like, I grew up in upstate New York, yeah. which means I learned about Native Americans. Mm -hmm. I can name all the Iroquois, Mohawk, yeah. et cetera. But we also learned about ice ages. Yeah. Like, global warming and cooling was, like, not a new thing to me. Like, yeah. you, you know, this this happens in cycles. But part of that was the poles flip. This this happens, right? So many people don't know that. And again, hopefully this is a science fiction thing, right? Is that... On average, and I forgot how many years it is, you know, 200, every 250 million years or something, the poles shift. Literally, the North Pole becomes the South Pole, right? Because the wobble gets off. And you see, if, if you track this at all, you see that the polar shift is now moved from true north, you know, when we first marked it, to now, you know, wherever it is, Russia or somewhere. And so um, right now, we are like, 10% overdue for a uh, polar shift. And so, um, you know, there's lots of, there's actually tons of articles written on it. Um, not much you can do about it. Like there's, this is not like, hey, don't, you know, lower your carbon footprint and this helps polar shift. Like the, this is a thing that just happens um, every, you know, every how many years it is. And um, we're way overdue. And so uh, hopefully, you know, in many lifetimes to come, that's not a thing. But you can imagine when a, uh, a plate shifts from an earthquake perspective, the result. Now imagine the whole earth flipping and all of the titanic plates that are associated with it just like now having a whole new spin. Like it, it would, you know. It's and described you, as catastrophic. And, and <laughs> what would that do to, to systems? Like how much of that would impact, like my computer would still boot up, I would think. 
well, what GPS I would going say, down, what I would sure say is if that happens and you call me and say my computer's not booting up, or you're probably focused on if the, the wrong calls. problem. Yeah, yeah, really, really. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. So, well, that but, was like, yeah. I, I mean, look, it, it, it it's not an electronic thing per se. I mean, it'll mess up GPS and all those types of things. But in the grand scheme of things, it's a it's a physical disaster. Uh, that would follow, right? Like GPS might be the only thing that does still work in that scenario. <laughs> one, one of the things I, I think I credit to, I, I've had some success in this this field is understanding the complexities. And one of the things I go to is as I was reading all these hacking books, I also read the protocols, but also the theories of complexity. So sure. one of the things I would read was Usenet News, mm -hmm. comp.risks. And there was this book called Computer Risks where it actually talked about the complexity of so many different things yeah. and they were citing future Y2K yeah, yeah. and future at the time it was mid nineties, you know, putting, putting these GPS enabled avionics systems where the, as the airplanes fly in over the equator, it flips over yeah. because of how the coding happened yeah. and just, you know, three dimensional mechanics and stuff like that. So I really do wonder if North South did flip, what would break and what, what wouldn't break. Yeah, and, you know, and going back to the cyber aspect of that, you know, again, Dennis Devlin, you know, who I've known forever, you know, one of his biggest statements was, you know, the biggest threat to security is complexity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's so true. Like, you know, it's, there's so many variables uh, that, you know, people can't consider. That's a, is a great scenario. Like, there's so many things that would happen in that scenario that you can't even start to break down the the physical well, aspect even in the the comp dot risk book I, i'm not i'm blanking on the author but mm -hmm. a lot of people wanted redundant systems mm -hmm. and often they would have two redundant systems whether it's power or comms or whatever sure. running through one pipe right you know and it's like yeah you put a cut, cut in that pipe yeah, yeah okay you know that's 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 tough and that's that's one of your other uh things that you looked at your scenarios where somebody did they they understood the physical layout of the internet mm -hmm. and they did specific targeted attacks mm -hmm. and this could have been homegrown terrorism this could have been a nation state it could have been environmental uh things and and a really you, upset carrier customer i mean yeah. a really upset carrier employee sorry and i i tell people that even today like nobody wants to see this but i see a lot of people they get on amazon and they just think oh it's never going to go down right and i'm like look if you're not taking advantage of everything amazon has to offer like right you know, using VPCs in Europe and, 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 and Asia, not just having one. Cause yeah, it runs yeah. great. I mean, the yeah. internet's fast, right? But they've had, they've had, you know, pots I mean, go down. They've had all that. Yeah. Happen. I mean, you had Nashville recently, you know, that, that took, you know, a significant portion of, of our data capabilities out. Uh, I ran security and business continuity for AT&T. And so Ed Amoroso did internal security. I did external security for customers, but I did all internal secure, I mean, internal business continuity. And so this, I literally took the job right after 9-11. And so the impact of 9-11, as you can imagine, you know, was pretty significant to AT&T and many carriers in that geographical area. And so um, our redundancy, you know, increased significantly. We did lots of analysis on water levels rising, for example, you know, not saying why water levels rising, like if it happens, you know, then we need to account for all of these telecom facilities that are now at, you know, zero ground level to uh, flood. Like, so what do we do? Like, do we build redundancy? Do we move them? Do, like, so we spent, you know, ton of time and effort moving uh, or, you know, replanning the network based on physical um, considerations. So one other thing that you had as a scenario was going after pundit hacks, like taking people who are famous, mm -hmm doxing them which is basically when you hack into them and you put their email their photos their documents out there which is completely different than crypto ransom sure. where you you just give them a chance to pay right before you do it right. but i thought you were spot on with with, with that when, as you look back and you look at what happens now what, what do you think yeah i mean obviously it's happened to many celebrities it's happened to politicians it's happened to uh everybody and um you know it was i probably presumed that there would be some element of the equivalent of ransomware built into that uh but you're right like this was not a like hey you know give me this and i'm sure there was lots of payments and stuff that you know prevented people from releasing materials but uh at the end of the day you know it was you know people taking the next level of hey you know you think these people are the greatest people in the world and i'm going to show you you know they have flaws just like the rest of us so. 
and and in the book you also have a section on secure comms mm -hmm. and we're still using email mm -hmm. you know and even though google and microsoft obviously they do a good job of keeping it crypt encrypted sure. and when it's in motion if you email me something i got crappy hygiene yeah. and i'm hacked you've got my email it's it's that straightforward so really why is. why don't you think we have more things like signal as our basis of communication yeah i think the um and, you, and we could poke holes at Signal too, right? Their authentications yeah, yeah, yeah. over SMS, that's not yeah. really the best thing. There, there's a ton of them. And, and, you know, people don't even do basic stuff like TLS and stuff like that, right? You know, with companies they constantly communicate with. So, you know, I, I think it is one of those things where 95% of the people in the world probably don't have anything to hide or, you know, transfer PII data day to day. But the people that do, represent the high value targets and obviously people have figured out not only the information in those email systems but how to leverage them from a social perspective to request send of payments and different things like that that i think have made that very aware and, and you know if somebody said hey outside of my pii phi you know data what would you say my most critical systems are i'd say Domain controllers, because um, no ransomware is successful widespread without compromising your domain controller. DNS, for obvious reasons. And your business email. Like, business email not, is it infrastructure, is it data, like, but it's like quasi. Those three things, if you can protect it, then you are doing much better than 95% of the world. Well said. All right, so closing out, what kind of science fiction do you like? I like all science fiction. So... Um, movies I, books what do you what do you read and what do you watch so i have converted my wife over so we watch um you know series after series of various things um we save some because we want something in retirement um mm -hmm. so you know we're like oh that looks really good let's uh let's hold off on that one but uh like you know original trekkie you know star trek guy so you know all the way back you know it was either gilligan's islands or star trek so i kind of gravitated towards uh star trek which by the way has lots of technology considerations that you think about if you really you know pay attention yeah. to the so detail. one of the reasons we named it Gulatex hyperfiction is that science fiction has struggled with many of these social issues that we yeah. have yet to answer yeah. here in the u.s you know what's the role of big tech what's the role of government what's the right. role of privacy what's the balance of, yeah. of that are we just ones and zeros out yeah. there you know it's it's crazy how much of this stuff yeah. is is very relevant yeah and, and even star trek like if, if you go back the, the lack of monetary gain the lack of you know there was still you know a position you were the captain versus and you know various levels so there was the promotability of success but there was no monetary you know value in that chain supposedly um so tra star trek you know any of the you know even the fireflies of the world and various other but anything space um you know really enjoyed is... really enjoyed that so if anybody hasn't seen firefly nathan fillion's first uh first series phenomenal yeah, it's yeah. a precursor to the reboot of Battlestar galactica yeah yeah had and a lot of really was good huge, obviously. yeah that was good how about expanse have you seen that i love expanse so yeah that's uh, that's all four or five i'm not seasons all there. up to to i think i'm season two or something like yeah, that but... there's and and when, when, when I say Star Trek and Expanse, like mm -hmm. Expanse is really good. Like they'll, they'll hit the wrists and everything pops up. Yeah. And it's secure. It's Hollywood. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's fiction. But you never really see them do, I have to reset my password. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You know it's, it's, we're, we're rebooting the thermal uh, yeah. reactor, you know, but, yeah. but we're never like doing, you know, that kind of basic yeah. stuff. And, and I also love the ones that take tech out, the, yeah. the futuristics, you know, the, the Broadlands, if you've ever watched Broadlands. I haven't seen that example. one. It's, it's oh, all... that's, yeah, they're like sword fighting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. about the world. Now, somehow, you know, they never figured out how to keep making bullets, which seems a little ridiculous. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, what would happen without power? What would happen with infrastructure? What would happen with roads? What would happen, you know, like all of these things, like all of a sudden, you don't want highways for your horses, mm -hmm. right? Like that's not practical. Um, and so, or not physical asphalt, you know, and so there's lots of things that kind of come out of that, that you start thinking about, you know, should, you know, there be a, a disaster of some sort and look, there's endless, uh, I mean, excuse me, there's not endless, um, power. So now we have electric cars and different things like that, which are cyber enabled now. So like, you know, all of a sudden, like I said, you know, what happens when GPS goes down? What happens when you can't recharge your car? What happens like all of a sudden, you know, you can see probably not 
worldwide events all at once, but you can see macro or micro types of impacts that could have big, you know, influences. How, how far away do you think we are to having androids that are human, you know, likeness, uh, like we have on Westworld? I uh, love Westworld. Um, pretty far. Yeah, I, I yeah, think, I think that's very uh, much the fiction. Yeah, uh, you know, I it, it does, because I'm not, that's not my space, but it does amaze me that we can't get more um, human-like responses from a computer. I mean, forget the physical aspects and the human and all that type of stuff, but it, it does seem like there is a, you could create a good baseline of human behavior mm -hmm. that could replicate some variability that would create a whole new human that would be so, you know, predictable or not unpredictable, you know, like a human uh, based on, you know, what the inputs are. Yeah. So without throwing shade on any cyber vendors who have AI in their marketing literature, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen any technology that's that that leads with an AI brand right. that really changes the hard work and planning that goes into people in a security operations center. I, I, so I would agree. I, I, so much like security, I don't think people leverage the capabilities of any of the tech that's out there, including AI and ML. Um, so our objective, and like if you looked at one of our slides, is, hey, look, we have to say we have AI and ML, because we do, and so why hide it? However, we talk a lot about the human feeding yeah. of that AI and ML to make it better and how we do it that differentiates us from the hype that other people are saying, oh, I just throw the data in and yeah. it spits out this magical thing. Yeah. That it's, it's, it's one cool. of those things where if you don't have machine learning and AI in your toolkit somewhere, you're doing it wrong. Right. But at the same time, if you're only relying on that and leading with it, right. you're probably not helping, which is which probably is interesting. Right. How about books? Are you a book reader at all? Not as much. Um, you know, I, I am I read a lot of what I would call books that I'd like to write in the future. Um, they tend not to be science fiction, surprisingly. I watch science fiction, but I don't read science fiction. Um, uh, I don't know if um, you've read any of the historical books that have a false narrative. So it's created, it's fiction, uh, but using history as a- Alternate a, history. Yeah, alternate yeah. history. Guns or history South. as a background, stuff right. like that. Yep. Uh, love those types of scenarios because I do believe that our timeline is pretty fragile and that you know um, a lot of individuals making different decisions could have a completely different impact on the future than what you know happens day to day. So we, we talked about AI not being a, re a reality. What about quantum, I'm not gonna say encryption, but let's just talk about actual quantum communications. Mm -hmm. If we get to the point where I can give you a device and you and I can con or communicate mm -hmm. through quantum entanglement, mm -hmm. you don't need encryption, you don't need anything, that's gonna get crazy. Well, maybe. So, yes, but um, why wouldn't you need encryption? Because one would argue they could also apply the same logic, same power into um, hijacking that as well. And so hard. I'd have to get a lot more nuclear physicists. Oh, to, yeah. To... No, I, believe me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think quantum, um, you know, creates barriers um, for uh, that help us in the cybersecurity realm, but that would imply that quantum isn't available to the bad guys. And, you know, I don't see, and I think Chris even said this on, on uh, one of his interviews, is um, quantum, we are so far behind in quantum investment compared to what other nations are doing, China, for example, um, that we could lose our competitive edge at a rate that has never been seen before if we don't invest at the same level. As I, and that can't only be enterprise. That's got to be the government uh, as well because, you know, other nations are investing at a, at a rate and it does create a multiplier effect just like we've seen in any computing that could monumentally take, you know, a year of investment ahead of us in one thing could create hundreds of years of difference in capabilities. It's it's very interesting. The quantum computing that I've been exposed to in my limited time doing, doing here, cyber, very limited. It's I've always been looking for quantum application. Now the obvious one is decrypting sure. somebody else's crypto, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's great. And and I had a quantum scientist tell me once. I asked him, so hey, has anybody figured this out? Yeah. He goes, no. And I go, why? 
And he goes, well, there's only so many quantum scientists, right? right. They're all not dying in car accidents and they all haven't disappeared on sabbatical, right? So he right. really thinks like once somebody figures out how to do this, sure. that's what you'll Boom. see. They'll, they'll, yeah. all get, they'll all get pulled in and, and it'd be like the Manhattan. And it's a sharing, yeah. you know, community, right? It like is. it's not one that, you know, arguably tries to keep everything secret. Unless again, it was state invested and state managed and yep. things of that sort, which is a different scenario. All right. So where can, what, what's, your, what's your ideal customer ponderance? Where can people go to find you? Uh, so ponderance.com, um, the, you know, the ideal customer is somebody that has acknowledged that they probably aren't going to be able to do it themselves, which is not, you know, that would, you know, well, that's middle market. No, that's not just middle market. That's like, you know, counterpain and everybody else helped fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that can recognize that they uh, aren't going to be able to do it by themselves and, um, need guidance from experts they've got to be able to have some affordability and to, to spend some money um but you know it's not like oh if you don't have two hundred thousand dollars a year you can't engage ponderance like we have customers that bill ten thousand a year um and then we have customers that bill you know millions a year and so um you know what we want to do is find customers that want to partner and they're you know they may come to us because of a compliance problem but they've got the willingness to truly improve their security over time. And the value that I think we bring to the relationship is by using the risk-based approach and, and kind of, you know, GRC as a background guidance and policy to help enforce, you know, your maturity path is we don't, if somebody asked me, would you rather me spend a hundred thousand dollars with you in three months doing a gap analysis, or would you rather spend a hundred thousand dollars over twelve months with me? I would say twelve months, and in two reasons. Number one, gap analysis goes stale really quick. Number two is that as you make changes and adjustments, things change, and so being able to look at that in an operational state provides high value. And number three would be is if you are getting your mentality around constant improvement, that doesn't happen in a short period of time. That happens because you learn it, you build muscles, and you're constantly starting to get the customer engaged into this, oh, I'm getting ready to roll this thing out. I should talk to Ponderance in advance of that, not the day I launch it, but three months in advance so they can give me some advice about X, Y, and Z. Um, and those are the types of customers we really want, you know, the ones that are partner. Otherwise, it becomes a transactional business. And that's, you know, been in this industry too long to run a transactional business. I, I think that's really well said. I think one of the things I like about, about Ponderance is that, you know, which, by the way, thank you for some uh, of the interest. Ha happy to do that. And, and I, I don't want get, to get ahead of this case, but you've had some chats with our portfolio funds yep. and, and portfolio accounts and whatnot. Holy crap. Portfolio companies. Sorry, guys. I <laughs> try to do more than just just invest and whatnot. But you guys aren't really based on the West Coast. You're not a DC thing. You guys are in the great state of Indianapolis yes, or, the Midwest. or Indiana. I like to call it the Midwest, state, right? And, city. And, and I just think that is a great thing. There's a lot of tech in the center of the country. Yep. And a lot of people kind of gravitate toward New York, Boston, you know, the, uh, uh, the NBA, yeah, you know, yeah. exactly. Uh, California, Silicon Valley. So I was very impressed that that there, there's some there's some really interesting tech out out, out the Midwest, uh, even like our, our Automox company yeah. based in Colorado, um, you know Bandura got a start in in St. Louis, yeah. which which uh, so you know I think that's 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 good stuff. And, and I think they they feel the urgency of the need of security, but they feel the patience of doing it right, and I think that is a great foundation for us to build upon is taking that patience and, and, and customer first, you know, you get, you know, I'm from North Carolina. So, you know, there's a lot of everything's about the relationship and, you know, in the Midwest, you have a lot of that. It's, it's not a, the customer needs this thing and, you know, do we do it or do we not? It's like, how do we do it? Like the customer needs it. They don't have any money. Let's figure out how to make this happen because, you know, it's the right thing to do. And so that customer focus, that customer, you know, um, success, that customer element of making sure you, you're thinking of the relationship and the position they're in, not just, you know, you as a company. And again, you know, 
like any company, we have to ultimately be a disciplined financial company. But, you know, you don't have to necessarily grow it 10 times a year. You don't necessarily have to make, you know, the profit margins that some of the other companies make as well. All right, last question. Are you going to write a book about Security 2030? I don't know. Do you want to write a book together on 2030? Rick Howard's in. I talked to him a few times about stuff like that. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Why exactly. not? That's, let's do it. So committing to that right we, here. We might want know. to do target like 2035 and then it's like, you know, or 20, yeah, 2035. That way we've got a couple of years to pull it we, together. We should just do it as, as like a series of TikTok videos. I, I can do that. There you, you know, go. I, I, you know, I haven't seen you dance, but you know, that's a whole different that's got that's, I can play, I can play <laughs> keyboard. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. All right, Doug Howard, thank you very much for coming on episode 21 of Gula Tech Cyber Fiction. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Ryan.